I wanna thank you all for attending today. I'm Dr. Piper Kendricks Williams, Chair of African American Studies. Um, the Department of African American Studies and Criminology welcomes you to this most relevant of events. I'm sure since this summer and George Floyd's murder and now his trial, policing uh, in America is really something on all of our minds, I hope. Uh, I would have liked to think that policing was on your mind before that, but you know, it takes you know, different events for all of us to become aware of things. Um, I would just like to take a moment to thank everyone who helped sponsor this event. So I wanna thank Jane Wong, the Dean of School of Humanities and Social Science, the Departments of African American Study and Criminology, the Division of Excellence, Inclusive Excellence, the Cultural and Intellectual Community Program Council, the Departments of Psychology and Women, Genders and Sexuality Studies, the Alan Dolly Center for the Study of Social Justice, and the Center for Community Engagement. I wanna especially thank Dr. Margaret Leger, the Chair of Criminology, and Chris Smith, the Shared Program uh, Administrator for African American Studies and Criminology, because they attended to every single detail to make this event happen, and I really appreciate that. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Leger, who's gonna tell us a little bit about today's format. Thank you, Dr. Kendricks Williams, and thanks again to the co-sponsors of this event and everyone in attendance this afternoon. 270 individuals from TCNJ and the local community registered for this event. Collectively, we look forward to learning about the important work that Dr. Goff and the Center for Policing Equity are doing to promote racial justice in policing. A few notes, this event is being recorded. After Dr. Goff's presentation, there will be a question and answer period. You can submit your questions to the host, African American Studies, using the chat feature. The live transcription feature has been turned on. If you would like to turn it off, select live transcription from the menu bar and select disable auto transcription. And now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Mitchell, a professor in the departments of African-American studies and criminology. Professor Mitchell. Thank you, Dr. Kendricks Williams and Dr. Leger. Um, again, my name is Michael Mitchell and I'm currently a visiting assistant professor in the departments of African-American studies and criminology here at the College of New Jersey. Before I introduce Dr. Goff, I must contextualize the backdrop of why he is present with us today. Before their involuntary arrival on these lands, African captives endured the first experiences of dif differential racialized policing. While not traditionally conceptualized as such, the Middle Passage and the subsequent system of slavery on these lands were the earliest forms of policing for black bodies. In the United States, historically oppressed groups have always experienced undemocratic forms of policing that persist today. As Dr. Jason Williams states in his piece on race as a carceral terrain, and I quote, just existing as black contemporaneously identifies one with the carcerality of blackness, end quote. While not the only victims of racially biased and discriminatory policing, black bodies were the first American experiment of policing. In its most vicious form, Undemocratic racialized policing results in brutal, premature death for black bodies and other minor, more minoritized groups. However, more commonly, racialized groups on these lands experience what Georges Abeyi coined as petite apartheid or subtle yet racially discriminatory encounters with police during the informal stages of the criminal legal system. Um, regardless of the situational context, ahistorical discussions of policing on these lands are incomplete and frankly, an injustice within itself. So today, the College of New Jersey welcomes Dr. Philip Goff to help us improve our understanding and challenge perceptions of race and policing issues. Dr. Goff is a renowned expert on racial bias in policing with an impressive publication record examining implicit bias and police behavior. Currently, Dr. Goff is a professor of African-American studies and psychology at Yale University. He received his AB from Harvard and PhD in psychology from Stanford University. He quickly became a national leader in the science of racial bias by pioneering scientific experiments that expose how our minds learn to associate blackness and crime implicitly, often with deadly consequences. This research led Dr. Goff to co-found the Center for Policing Equity, a university research center now supported by the 501c3 Policing Equity Organization Created at UCLA where Dr. Goff received tenure, the center grew to be the world's largest research and action think tank on race and policing. The Center for Policing Equity also hosts the world's largest collection of police behavioral data 
in the National Science Foundation funded National Justice Database. This database now serves as a tool to reduce burdensome and inequitable policing through scientific analyses. Dr. Goff has won two American Psychological Association Early Career Awards, the Association for Psychological Science Rising Star Award, and the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives Lord G. Seeley Award, among many others. He regularly appears on cable news, provides congressional testimony, and was a panelist for President Obama's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. On behalf of the College of New Jersey and our co-sponsors, we welcome you, Dr. Goff, and are deeply grateful for your acceptance of our invitation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Mitchell. Um, I, I think you forgot um, a very important element of my introduction. I was also a best drawer in second grade. My mother's still very proud. <laughs> um, I want to say thank you to Dr. Uh, Leger and thank you, Dr. Kendrick Williams as well. Thank you to everybody who made this possible. Um, thank you all for showing up because it's not a talk if I'm talking to myself. Um, my wife reminds me of that. Um, and I also want to thank the folks of y'all who decided to get dressed for this and keep your videos on. I'm not actually clowning you. When you're giving a presentation like this in such a bizarre time, having just any feedback, like all of you who are already re reacting negatively to the amount of light on my face, I appreciate that. At least I know that y'all can see it. Um, so I was asked to talk a little bit about the work that I've done. Um, and you know, I'm a social scientist, which means I'm a nerd. And I'm a professor, which means I'm also a nerd. Um, so nerd squared means I have PowerPoint. And so I have things to talk to share on PowerPoint um, that I hope will not just be the standard that will not just be like I'm not sitting here just trying to give a lecture in the sort of pejorative sense. But before I get into any of that because you don't I didn't write the PowerPoint this morning I know I'm a last minute but I'm not that last minute. What that means is I wrote this talk and I thought about what I wanted to share with this really tremendous community of folks who are collaboratively learning, not just for the sake of credential, but for the sake of translating what we learn in class into the world. I did that at a time when Derek Chauvin was not currently on trial. I did that at a time before New York City decided they were going to legalize marijuana and 40% of the tax proceeds were going to go to underserved vulnerable communities. And yet there's still going to be people serving in Rikers convicted of the crime that is now legal. And by the way, the majority of that tax base will benefit those who have access to business licenses, which means folks who haven't been convicted of the crime of selling the thing that now is gonna be legal. The point is that we're living in a world where the landscape is adjusting so quickly um, that if your questions about what's going on, or your questions for the work that we do, or I do at the Center for Policing Equity, if they have evolved to be broader or more specific than anything I'm talking about, really don't let that dis distract you in any way. There is a lot of stuff going on right now, and we don't have nearly the time to, to deal with it as extensively as we could and should. I'll just leave this here at the front end, and I'll probably come back to it at the back. Um, last week was an earthquake in the world that I work in. It was an earthquake, not just because of what was happening in New York, not just because of the unveiling of new attempts to decouple systems of punishment from systems of social support, but specifically because of what happened in Ithaca, New York. In Ithaca, New York, for those who are not following, it's a tiny town. There's a guy who used to, he was in the office. He went to a school up there, Cornell's up there. Um, that city and that county, Tompkins County, did something remarkable that literally on April 1st brought tears to my eyes. They dismantled their police department. I should say they passed the resolution that is the plan that they're locked into now to dismantle their police department. It will be replaced with the Department of Community Solutions and Public Safety, led by a civilian, majority unarmed, no armed contact with low level offenses or any non-enforcement offenses with a public health center as a pro as, and the outcome is a process led by community. That's the remarkable piece of it. To me, the most eye popping piece though, is that earlier that week, the Police Benevolent Association, the union of the Ithaca PD endorsed the plan to dismantle the police department. There could not be a more important time to figure out how we're gonna implement all this reimagining that we're doing. 
And so before I get started on the stuff that we've been up to and highlighting some of the brilliant folks I get to work with who've done some smart things that I get to take credit for because I'm old, um, I want to give to everybody who's, who can hear my voice some advice that was the most important advice I got when I was an undergraduate. I got to study with some really fancy people with really big afros. And one of them brought me into the office and I was feeling down about something. I was, I was, some woman had me down talking about like, she, she needed to move on to do other things. I was having a college experience and I hadn't really taken seriously the set of notes I had for the independent study. And so the professor said, look, Phil, I understand that you were hurting. You hurt in a way the human beings hurt. But I don't know that you understand that you're important to the things that you care about. And I don't mean that in a small way. The vision for the things that you care about that you have, you know, anybody else have it. And it may very well be the case that you will be in position to see that vision made real in the world. So I need you to take your life seriously and take that vision seriously because it can matter to the things that you care about. If you're hearing my voice, that is true of you, at least as much as it's true of me. More so, if you are anything like younger than me, and I'm 187 years old, so that's almost everybody here. I implore you, as you're listening to this, as you're thinking about this, you are important to the things you care about. And I would love for you to take that as seriously as possible because if you're hearing me and you showed up to this because you know you didn't have to, that means you also are important to the things I care about. So I want to start there with that invocation. Let me see if I can make technology work for a second. There's a thing here that says share screen. There's a thing here that says Microsoft PowerPoint. There's a thing here that says share. Bam! Y'all should be looking at the back of a head of somebody. Did I get that right? Woo! Don't need no grandkids to tell me just yet. All righty. So I want to talk about race and policing and fixing what's broken for the next time that we, the next bit of time that we've got. Okay. And I want to start with this quote that floored me the first time I heard it. And it didn't floor me because of the accuracy of it. It floored me because of the context of it. The quote was this, if policing is supposed to protect people, then American policing has been profoundly broken in black communities for generations. Now this should not be you know, earth shattering to anybody who's listening to this, but what was earth shattering to me was that at the, at the time when I heard it, it was said by a police chief who was 17 feet tall with a handlebar mustache and a Mormon who was running the Salt Lake City Police Department. And I said to him, so wait, I don't understand. Who are you discriminating against in the city of Salt Lake? You discriminate against the tan Mormons? He said, actually, Salt Lake City is a UN refugee resettlement city. And I felt like a jerk, because I was. But the idea is that if folks in that kind of political context could understand this, right, in the early aughts, then we've known this for quite some time. And the reason why we are here is not because experts have known or elites have known but because we all got a front row seat to some portions of this. In the death of Eric Garner, the death of, death of Oscar Grant, Trayvon Martin, not killed by law enforcement, but killed by someone who wanted to be. The death of Tarek Smith, the death of, of uh, <clears throat> uh, Rakia Boyd, the death of 93-year-old Pearly Golden, and of course, Michael Brown Jr. And most recently, Breonna Taylor, and this week, we are remembering, we are lifting up and holding close the memory of George Floyd. All of these people who didn't understand, didn't know, didn't aspire to their last moments on earth being a reason why we could engage in a reimagining of a public right to the human social contract. We can't be talking about this unless we're talking about their lives and the consequence and the, the legacy we want to gift back to them for their sacrifice they gave to us. And when I say sacrifice, I don't mean intentional or willful. I mean, they were forced to give it up. And in that context, what then is broken? Well, it's both that the burdens and disparities in police behavior are something broken in our system, not broken in policing necessarily, but broken in our system. But it's also how we explain that behavior and who we try and hold accountable for it. But mostly here today, I wanna to talk about it's how little we know about police behavior. Could you imagine knowing as little as we know about police behavior about hospital outcomes? Could you imagine knowing as little as we know about police behavior about school and academic outcomes, about economic outcomes? You think CEOs would allow that to happen? And yet we have no national data on police behavior, no federalized data on police behavior. 
sometimes every couple of years, we ask communities, what did the police do? Not enough, and it's broken in how we deliver public safety. So the goals of this talk, I wanna provide a social psychological framework for racism in policing. I say social psychological because my training is as a social psychologist, not because I think it's a superior discipline, um, <clears throat> but because I think it's actually useful to think about because most folks think of racism as prejudice and that resides within social psychology. I wanna test that framework a little bit with you and show you how we're testing it, demonstrate a little bit of, that, of, the, of the framework's utility and show that putting science in action can do some kind of good. The outline for that is I'm gonna talk about that broken theory that we've got. Again, it's not, I'm not saying that policing is broken. Policing may very well be doing exactly what it was intended to do, but our theories around it might be broken. And then I wanna talk about encounter level racism and community level racism and how specifying those levels can help us think better, more efficiently, more usefully at ridding ourselves of that racism. I'm going to talk a little bit about doing something about it. All right, so for the three people I can see on the screen right now, are y'all with me? Okay. I say, and I should say this a little bit. I should prepare you just a little before I go into the first part. Okay. I know, I'm aware we are not in a Black church, but I am always of the Black church. And what that actually means is not that I'm going to require you to say amen, though some of you may feel so moved, but that I am used to a little bit of call and response. And in these trying COVID times, that's a little bit difficult to do. So I may ask you, are you with me? And if you can give me a thumbs up or nod, that is helpful. I may in fact, at some point, ask you to come off of mute so I can get that call and response going also so that I can keep y'all awake for those of y'all who the sound of my voice might bore. So does that work for y'all? Just to make me feel a little bit more comfortable? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. All right, thank you very much. I see someone with a direct message for an amen that always works. All right, let's get into it. In part one, let's talk about our broken theories. Okay, so there are two theories I want to talk about that are broken in the context of how we think about public safety. The first is our theory of racism, and the second is our theory of policing. All right, let's talk first about that theory of racism. Now, this is the question that has foundationally set up all of the research that I've done as a professional nerd. What causes discrimination? And if you think about what the most common definition to this, uh, this answer, the most common answer to this question is, it's bad people, right? Now, the color of this devil might change depending on what kind of discrimination we're talking about, but it's bad people. And the only problem with this definition, the answer to this question, is that it doesn't fit the data. And here's what I mean. So these are data taken from what is called the Princeton Trilogy. I'm a Harvard dude and I'm a Yale dude, so I just assume it's because people at Princeton can't learn to, to count past three. This is clearly five time courses of data, but it's called the Princeton Trilogy. Um, <clears throat> and the reason is, the reason that, that it's, it's important for us is because these are white undergraduate endorsement of negative stereotypes about black folks. Okay. And what we're seeing from 1933 to 2000 is not just that superstition is more than a Stevie Wonder song. It's that things get better. This could not just be people learning the politically correct thing to say. Things get better up into 2000. And then in 2008, we got a black president and racism was over, right? But of course not, because as things change. So this is not attitudes. What I'm showing you now is actual inequality. And right? it's expressed as a ratio black to white. I'm aware that discrimination is beyond black and white. I only got an hour, give me a little bit of rope. So what I mean by this is that if a black child were as likely to die in infancy as a white child, these lines right here would be at the, the line at one, right? And what we see is that they're actually going up over time for both for infant mortality, unemployment, if we stretch poverty back, also for poverty. Now, in the, the words of the great W.B. Du Bois, how does that sound? How on earth do you have the context of declining prejudice but persistent or increasing inequality. How do we make sense of that and fix it? And I'll say, this is only, for the, many of you, when I said, oh, the most common definition of racism is that it resides in the hearts and minds of bad people, you shake shaking your hand, well, that's crazy. And yet this juxtaposition is somehow shocking. It's impactful, it's meaningful. It's only meaningful if we start with an assumption that attitudes are somehow at the root of behaviors. It's only surprising from that position. So I wanna say, even if we are intellectually sophisticated enough to understand that racist attitudes are not the only game in town, it's been so overlearned that we feel that juxtaposition as something noteworthy. So how do we make sense of it and how do we fix it? 
So I'm going to provide some language for this, some, some breaks in our theory. The language is the language of identity traps. It's a label or a frame for contemporary bias that's rooted in human psychological universals that tend to end badly. And there are two types, fast traps and slow traps. So what is a fast identity trap? Well, it's automatic, it's uncontrolled, it's hard to prevent, not thinking brings it out. And if you've heard the term implicit bias, and I trust that you have, implicit bias is a form of fast trap, right? Fast traps are larger than that, is the larger category. Okay. Now, I have found in my time talking about this stuff that because we've so overlearned the wrong thing, it's useful to not just tell about the right thing, but to show. So I'm going to do a risky thing right now. I'm going to ask all of you, go ahead and take yourselves off of mute and just shout back the answer as fast as you can. You're going to do it together. No individual is going to be uh, embarrassed. <laughs> shout back as fast as you can the answer to the question as we go. Okay? okay. I'm going to show you a fast trap. Okay. <clears throat> First question, as fast as you can. What kind of music did Peter, Paul, and Mary play? Rock. Okay, it's folk. It's folk. Let's do it again. What kind of music did Peter, Paul, and Mary play? Okay, what's the, the wire in the center of a wheel is a? Smoke. Smoke. Smoke comes out of the end of a cigarette. It is. Smoke. Okay, comedian tells you this, makes you laugh. It is a? Yeah. If you have no money, you are? Yo. What's the white part of an egg? Yo. What's the white part of an egg? Yo. yourselves again, please. Everybody mute yourself again, please. The white part of the egg is the egg white. Thank you. I'll be here all week. Make sure to tip the wait staff, try the veal. All right. Now, a couple things to take from this example of a fast trap. Okay, first, it is not that I'm a wizard who can control your mind, so that's totally true. It's that I'm a wizard who can control your behaviors. Y'all did a thing. Speech is an act. I'm just gonna remind everybody, please do put yourself on mute, right? We can hear the little clicky clack. We can also hear the conversation with folks. So a little bit on mute. It's a risky thing to do over Zoom. Okay. So it's, this is a behavior, the overlearned associations between things that rhyme and the question that I'm asking had all of y'all out there, brilliant, educated folks saying that the yolk is the white part of the egg. Again, for clarification, the white part of the egg is the white part of the egg. That would be an egg white or the albumin if you want to be really super sophisticated about it. I did not know that when I started doing this, but somebody told me. The other thing I think is really key in all of this is that I and my heart don't believe that any of you in your hearts are yokists, which is to say this is not revealing of character, right? This is an overlearned association. It's a mental association. It's fun to do. By the way, I'm saving y'all's lives. Do not try this at home. You're going to do it. And people will be like, it's egg white. What the heck is wrong with you? I'm a professional, okay? But the reason why I say it's important to get that y'all are not yokists is because these overlearned associations are often not funny. If we had done the same thing, I said, and what are women? And you said, overly emotional. That's not funny. What are Latino folks? They're, they're illegal. It's not funny. What are black folks? Well, they're criminal. You get the idea. But it's the same process that can produce the same kind of outcome. That's a fast trap. Not quite implicit bias, the same kind of roots, the same kind of consequences. Now, I also want to note fast traps are their great demonstration tools. It's why social psychology en enrolls so many undergraduates all the time. Okay. They're also epistemologically seductive in a way that can be dangerous. I told you the most common definition of racism is that it begins with the hearts and minds of defective people somehow. And we can easily put fast traps as, oh, it's a defective mind. That's not actually how it works. But we've seen people try and make implicit bias into a thing that is a catch-all for everything. And it's, it's the wrong character. That's why it's important to talk about slow traps too. Slow traps are conscious, they're self-directed. It's about me and they're ruminative. They're negotiated over time. You know you're in a slow trap and they tend to encompass threats to one's self-concept like masculinity threat and stereotype threat, the concern about being seen by negative stereotype about one's group, right? Now in here, I don't wanna do too many shows because we're gonna show it in a lot of the research that I'm gonna show you. And I wanna be really clear that in both cases, there is bigotry in the world, but it's not just bigotry. It's not just effective hearts and minds. And if it's not just bigotry, how do we begin to develop a language that allows us to both talk about it and then intervene on it? 
And what I would say to you is this language of traps, which foregrounds not just mechanisms, but that situations are powerful. That's one of the uniquely useful things that social psychologists can bring to this conversation. And as a social psychologist, I want to bring it. So if we're in that context where it's more than bigotry, that requires there's a fundamental need for a social psychological approach to police racism, where situations are key. But which ones? So that's what I'm going to be talking about for most of the rest. And before we get there, let's talk a little bit about our broken theory in policing. And we're going to do that in the context of the six words that are super useful for understanding what we mean when we talk about racism. So we'll start with the first word, the stereotype. I'm just going to use what social psychologists have tended to do with these words. The stereotype is the idea. You can be aware that there's a stereotype that black people, all black people are great at basketball. And then you will watch me play basketball and know that the stereotype is not true, which is sad for me because I'm from Philly. Like I grew up with Iverson and still. But the stereotype is just the idea, not the endorsement. And you have prejudice, which is the feeling. I like you before I even know you. I don't like you before I know you. The preju prejudice, the prejudgment is actually just living in the feeling. So you have the idea, the feeling, you have bigotry, which is the endorsement of both or either. Right? Thinking that those are okay. You've got discrimination, which is the behavior. And then you've got bias, which is kind of the catch-all. So you can have racially biased ideas, racially biased feelings, racially biased behaviors, racially biased endorsements. Why do we need the word racism? What purpose is it serving? Well, all of these words can, you can have a racial stereotype, racial prejudice, racial bigotry, racial discrimination, racial bias. None of them capture the patterns and the power behind it. Racism is required as a word so that we have language for patterns, for history. And without that word, all of the rest of the words we have it, would be powerless to describe the experience of not only experiencing something, but knowing it can happen again. Right? <clears throat> History and power are fundamental and it operates at multiple levels. It's not just an interpersonal thing, which is to say racism is not an audit test. And that is part of the ways in which we have failed in our theorizing about policing. So we'll talk about three levels of policing, the encounter level, the community level and the city level. This is for the sociology students, micro, meso, and macro, but it functions differently. And here's what I mean. So imagine you've got a police officer. And by the way, clip art is terrible at this, right? But I didn't want to use actual officers in it. So here we go. You got an officer who treats people who wear purple. And Alice Walker's just going to decide that those are the black folks differently than people who wear red, right? Alice Walker's going to decide those are the white folks. So if we're treating the purple people badly and the red people well, that's encounter level. I'm treating you poorly because of the group you belong to, you well because of the group you belong to, that's encounter level racism. That's usually how we talk about it, but it's not the only level. Because I could very well go into a community where the majority of households are black. There's still white people who live there, but the majority of households are black. In a different community, majority of households are white. There's still black people who live there, so I'm not treating individuals within the community differently. I'm treating everyone within the community the exact same. But if I choose to, if I treat the folks in the black community worse than the folks in the white community, on aggregate, black folks with worse outcomes. That's a little closer to how policing is actually deployed. And there's one other level that the folks who have started to think about this often don't consider, right? Which is that I could treat everybody in the city the same. Everybody in the city, in the greatest city in the history of the world, I can treat everybody the exact same. But if I treat everybody in Philadelphia poorly and everybody in Bridgeport well, we know what the racial demographics are there. Again, on the aggregate, you end up with bad outcomes. So a psychologist's job here is to specify which level we mean and the psychological factors that influence each level, as well as the consequences. And in social psychology, we're mostly going to be focused on, on those first two, the encounter level and the community level. Right? So a social psychological framework for engaging in this stuff for the nerds amongst you who are interested in experiments where you get to lie to undergraduates and then see what they do, because that's the job of a social psychologist. Our job is to identify common situations, study those situations, compare prejudice as a predictor to other factors like those situations. And in this context, our theory of policing, right, the dominant theory is that policing is necessary everywhere to keep people safe. And there is evidence policing can reduce crime. 
but there is little evidence about what it costs. You think about a cost benefit analysis, we know about the benefits of policing because there's been generations studying policing saying, here are the benefits. But when I call those individuals and I say, please come and talk to me about race on a National Academy of Science Sciences panel, when I said, please come and talk to me about how your research is inflected by race, they say, we don't know anything about that. We've done a cost benefit model where all we've done is study the benefit and we've never seriously taken uh, up the cause of the cost. So I want to, want to make you clear on this. There is not a single real estate agent in the history of Christendom who's been able to close a deal by saying, and you know what? If you buy this house, you get to call 911 more often. How great is that? It's not a thing. We are all safer without the need for a police. If we're in situations where we can manage our crises by ourselves. And in the same way, if there is a need for crisis intervention at a community level, that, that need is not always for a badge and a gun to show up. If my crisis is homelessness, how is a badge gonna, gonna help me get out of that? Like the, the, the solution to that is a roof and four walls, not a badge and a gun. So we might do better with our theory of policing if we articulate the four principles. And for the interest of time, I'm gonna do this quickly and then move on to some science. But I think it's useful in this moment that we should be resisting white supremacy and that systems of white supremacy should be resisted and dismantled whatever they, wherever they can be. Amen, amen. Thank you, Doc. We should be reducing the crises, which is to say we should be giving re resources to communities so that they don't need to be calling out in crisis in the first place. When they are calling out in crisis because of our own failings to provide those resources, and I wanna be clear, every call to 911 is a policy failure. When they are in crisis, we should be sending the right resources. And the last one, which is both the hardest and therefore the most important to articulate in this moment. The things that we do to change the systems that we have should not impede our journey to the systems that we need. We shouldn't allow today to obstruct what we need tomorrow. Which is to say, if we imagine a set of solutions for today, Let's make sure that no politician, no community group, no philanthropic body, no nonprofit, no professor can use that as a way to say, great, now we're done. We don't have to get to this other stuff. Because too often in communities, that's what happens. And so we end up with programs that end up funding law enforcement that don't end up working. And then communities are left with no more authority to ask for more. Hey, we just did what you just asked, or at least a part of it. It's the hardest one to balance and therefore the most necessary to articulate. Let's not allow today to obstruct tomorrow. So translating these theories is what we'll need to do, these principles. And I wanna demonstrate there's a role that social science can play specifically at the encounter level in this next section. All right, so let's get to some science. I know y'all came to hear numbers, right? So which situations are we gonna try and manage? Remember I said situations are gonna be powerful. Which situations are gonna be powerful? So I'm going to talk about when law enforcement officers, I'm talking about the encounter level, just the encounter level for right now, are confronted with vulnerable groups, right? Because that primes stereotypes and negative consequences for that dehumanization. Confronted with stereotype threat. So for the officer, it's going to be, I'm worried that I'm going to be seen as racist, which does bad things, usually not for the officer or not as much for the officer as for the person they're encountering. Or when they're confronted with anti-egalitarian norms, with norms that say, hey, we should actually not all be equal, stratification and hierarchy are really important. I'm gonna talk about those three types of, of, of situations that are common to the law enforcement experience and what the consequences are. And I should say, we should all be embarrassed. So for the students, y'all don't have to be. Everybody who is above the student grade should be embarrassed that the stuff I'm showing to you, we didn't know before. That's not because I'm brilliant. It's because we've been lazy as a society trying to look at this stuff. We shouldn't, none of us who are famous firsts should have been here first. So let's do that first one. Confronted with vulnerable groups. I'm gonna talk about childhood and who gets to be a child. So some of my previous research revealed, as did uh, folks coming before me, Sandra Graham, Brian Lowry, Anita Rattan, um, uh, an age overestimation effect. Literally the black, Children, black boys in particular in my research, now been replicated by Georgetown, black girls are seen as older than they actually are. Black children seen as less innocent, more responsible for their actions than they actually are, both in laboratory settings and in the field. Some of the field studies that have not yet been uh, uh, published are distressing. But what's the consequence to that? What happens when we see black children as older than they are? 
But we wanted to look, and uh, just fair warning, I don't look in places that make us happy and overjoyed and surprisingly joyful. Um, I look in places to see what the, the terrible consequences can be so we can mitigate them. I see that as part of my mission, my mantle. So we examined nine cities for use of force rates, nine different cities, and we compared by race and age. And we're gonna look here just, I'm gonna stay in that black, white paradigm, black and white, adults and children. And we benchmarked our rates of use of force against arrest rates for the race age category. So if I'm looking at white adults, I'm looking at white adult rates, right? As a fraction, the white adult rates of use of force are the numerator, the denominator is the arrest rates for white adults in that city, okay? So this is a conservative test because we understand that black children and adults are over arrested compared to their actual commission of crimes. It's a conservative, if we're looking for disparities, a conservative estimate of that. And what we expected here was that childhood was gonna be protective, but more so for white kids than for black kids. So we're gonna do this for you, I think, in three different gra uh, graphs. Yes, in three graphs. In the first one, I'm just looking at the child to adult force ratio. So again, think about a fraction. Look at the child use of force ratio as the numerator, the denominator of that fraction is gonna be the adult use of force ratio. We want these numbers to be small because we want kids to get beat up by cops less often. I'm gonna show you black in the dark blue, I'm sorry, uh, white in the dark blue and black in the light blue. The child to adult force ratio. Y'all there with me? Yes, thank you, okay. So the child to adult force ratio for white folks across these nine is 0.41. A little less than half is likely to get, get beat up in an encounter with law enforcement if you're a child and adult for white kids, but not for black kids, more than twice as high, almost one-to-one, -one, almost as if childhood isn't protective at all. Let's cut these data a different way. Let's look at the black to white force ratio. So black on the top of the fraction, white on the bottom of the fraction. We, these numbers are gonna be over one, Nationwide, we think of these numbers as being somewhere in the two to four range, and these participating departments, they are relatively progressive, so it's going to be a little bit lower. I'm now I'm going to show you adults in the dark blue and children in the light blue. Again, black to white force ratio. So for adults, black adults are 1.64 times as likely to have force used on them more often than our white adults, twice as high amongst children, black children. 3.72 times more likely to have force used on them. Now we were gonna do some, some fancy statistics on them. We we're gonna do some fancy hierarchical regression models, um, count regressions, because it's zero inflated and all that kind of stuff. But the stats folks there, this is a real cool place to do really fancy stats. But I'm not gonna show you in the third graph anything fancy. I'm gonna show you what one of our staffers found that made all of us lose our minds that day. Just the median use of force rate per 1,000. So the number of use of force incidents per 1,000, if you're a white adult in the dark or a black child in these, across these nine cities, it's about 12 for white adults and 14 and a half for black children. That means you are more likely to have force used against you as a black child than as a white adult. So we expected that childhood would be protective just less so for black children. What we found was that childhood was protective, but that whiteness was more protective than childhood. We say that one more time, whiteness was more protective than childhood across our nine cities. And what does this tell us about what policing in schools should look like? What does it tell us about what the state's ability to protect children in the first place looks like? And what resources should be available through 911 for children? I could do a whole bit on that. I wanna make sure we get a range here and that we don't just stay here because children are not the only folks affected. So next I wanna talk about that second situation, the situation of concern that I'm gonna be seen as racist as a law enforcement officer. This is work I did with Rick Trinkner at, the, uh, at Arizona State University, um, <clears throat> former postdoctoral fellow uh, with us at Yale and a stand-up guy. So again, stereotype threat. This is the concern with being evaluated in terms of or conforming to a negative stereotype about one's group. And the biggest stereotype about police they're racist. It's the biggest stereotype. Police are concerned about it. Communities are concerned about it. But you might ask, well, why would this predict biased behavior, right? If they're worried about being seen as, as racist, shouldn't they just be less racist? I need to explain something to you that if you've not engaged with law enforcement before, you will not know. Law enforcement are told 
you must maintain control of the situation to be safe. Because if you and I are connecting together, right? And you think you can take me, one of us is going home hurt. But if you know I'm in control, everything's okay. So my authority is literally a stand-in. It's a proxy for my safety if I'm off an officer. And you get taught you have three forms of authority with which to keep control. You have your legitimate authority. I'm the law, you do what I say. And most people do. You have your social authority. That's your verbal authority. I can talk you down. I can relate to you. Hey, man, don't give me a hard time. If and only if those two forms of authority fail, do I go into my third, which is my coercive or my physical authority. So I ask you, if I'm law enforcement and you approach me and you call me racist, or I think you believe that I'm racist right away, what forms of authority do I have? For most officer, you just have coercive. So if anything pops off, anything gets a little bit strange, I'm using force right away. So if I'm worried chronically that I'm seen as racist, I do not have the forms of authority that I am taught and trained to keep me safe. So we, we thought this was a, a way to frame it, but do we know it's true? Not until we look out into the world. So we did a study where we recruited 786 patrol officers, 80% of the men, 55% white. By the way, if you think that's too many uh, men and too many white people, this is a very almost outlier gender integrated and racially integrated police department. Right, nationwide, eighty-seven percent men. That's that's uh, major city law enforcement. So mean age here is about forty-three years old. They've had fourteen years on. We measured explicit and implicit bias. We asked about stereotype threat, legitimacy of myself, and how do you feel about excessive force. Let me be clear on when I say we asked about. These are the questions we asked. For stereotype threat, we asked them literally. I worry people think I am racist because I'm a police officer. We weren't trying to be clever. We just asked them straight up. For self-legitimacy, how, how legitimate are you, right? I am confident using the authority that has been given to me as a police officer. Again, not trying to be clever. And then how do we measure their feelings about excessive force? We literally ask them the thing that everybody gets taught. Literally, everybody is in the state of New Jersey, the state of Minnesota. This is a, a common example when you're getting taught about what excessive force is. We ask them, I would approve of an officer striking a suspect who said vulgar or obscene things to the officer. I'm okay with that officer striking someone because he didn't like the way or she didn't like the way that person spoke to them. Blatant excessive force. Okay. So I'm going to do a little bit of statistical model. If you're not a stats person, it's perfectly fine. If you are a stats person, welcome. We've had jackets made. What we're looking for is does that concern with being seen as racist predict the unreasonable use of force? And does it happen because I have lost my legitimacy, my ability to have legitimate or social authority? So what we're going to see, if you see a, a little asterisk, it means yes, those things predicted. So that concern with being seen as racist, it predicted unreasonable use of force. It also predicted negatively self-legitimacy. So the more I was worried about being seen as racist, the less legitimacy I thought I had. And by the way, the more legitimacy I thought I had, the less I endorsed unreasonable force. So much so, the stereotype threat, that concern with being seen as racist, no longer directly influenced. The whole point is it went through this pathway. It's called a mediation model if you're a, a student thinking about stats, right? And what we're showing here is strong proof of mechanism. That's how this worked. So we've recently replicated this in Australia. This is not just a US uh, phenomenon. And I want to be really clear, the intervention here is not comforting officers and making them feel better about themselves. That's because legitimacy is earned. The intervention is making police departments more worthy of trust. The word trust in the context of public safety has gotten a bad rap right now because folks have been using the word trust to say, you should just trust. We should get communities to trust. Like PR is the thing that law enforcement needs. Communities are not stupid, and those interventions are. And I'm a scientist, so I get to say that. The intervention is law enforcement needs to earn the trust. Excessive force in this way is literally reduced through actual equity. Treat people right, and we will actually reduce unnecessary and excessive force. And I'm looking at time. I want to get through this. So let me get to that third situation in the encounter level, because I want to get to the community level and beyond. 
Because here we're going to talk about situation of social hierarchy or anti-egalitarian norms. This is work that I've done uh, with uh, Jill Swensionis. Happy to say that last week this work uh, just got an in-press in Proceeding of National Academies of Sciences. Um, and it's built on work by um, <clears throat> Jeff Alpert and Roger Dunham talking about order, maintenance, uh, um, or, order and authority maintenance policing. So order and maintenance policing, you guys remember the dung dung from Law and Order? Right, it's the order part that's the hard part. The law part's pretty easy. The order part is, all right, y'all act a wild. I'm law enforcement. I'm, I'm gonna get you to stop. Under what authority? My job is to keep order. Now, remember how I said I have to keep control to stay safe? That means if you define my authority, I'm not safe. And if I'm not safe, we know what law enforcement's allowed to do. So Alpert and Dunham refer to this as authority maintenance policing. My job is not just to go out and, and maintain the order, it's to maintain my authority. This is where the framing of contempt of cop comes from. But question, if order is not just everybody behaving themselves and nobody having a block party unauthorized, it's actually, the, the, if order is the same thing as the social hierarchy, then when I see folks at the bottom of the hierarchy stepping out of line, that's also a threat to my personal safety. So we have reframed this and we think, we hope taking a step further to talk about hierarchy maintenance policing. Right? And this should be particularly true from those who benefit from the hierarchy. So in this context, we've now done this in three cities. I'm going to show you two cities and then data from one. Um, but in three cities, here we're talking about a, a large U.S. East Coast city and a, and a southern city. We get total uh, over 400 officers. And they're asked about social dominance. That's, hey, things should be hierarchical. We should have people on top and people on the bottom. We ask about implicit bias, explicit bias, trust of law enforcement, right? trust of the community. We got five years worth of citations, stops, use of force uh, data and demographic data and rank from the officers. We got a lot of data from the officers. What we're looking for here again is the idea that social hierarchy needs my physical force as defense. Right? What I'm gonna show you is simply, remember we thought that for the people who benefit from the hierarchy, it's gonna be even stronger stronger than we expected. For white officers, the more they believed, and it's actually easier shown this way, for white officers, the more they believed that hierarchy was good, the more force they used in the commission of their jobs. It's the opposite for black officers. That finding, by the way, doesn't replicate to other things. The white officer finding replicates across three different cities. And for non-black, non-white officers, that line is flat. That's actually the trend line for black officers in the other two cities. And this calls into question the mission of policing in the first place. Because if keeping order is associated with hierarchy, we got to shift the mission, right? Because otherwise, order keeping is a recipe for unnecessary force. But I told you this happened at multiple levels. So let me get into the community level, okay? Some of y'all reading my, my sub uh, uh, title here. Don't get ahead of yourself with my jokes. So what is the situation? Situation is when folks imagine that there is conflict between groups. Call it realistic group conflict. That's the situation we think is likely to provoke these kinds of conflicts. So <clears throat> I wanna be really clear. Sometimes it is not the police driving the behaviors we don't like. Sometimes it's us. Calls to 911. And because we fixate on officer character, we know very little about 911 calls. Right? So we need to know more about, we need to understand more about that. Specifically, we need to understand this. It's a woman who was known in the meme sphere as Barbecue Becky, who called police because she saw black people barbecuing in the area designated for black people barbecuing on Lake Merritt in Oakland. She, she thought that you needed a permit. It turns out that she was wrong. And in a wonderful uh, moment of both police uh, propaganda and happy endings, police did show up and they enjoyed delicious potato salad. So why do calls for service matter? They matter because they may reflect demographics or interests within a jurisdiction, right? They may reflect the prejudices of some groups some and subgroups within that. So for instance, who feels comfortable calling the police? If I call the police, do I feel comfortable uh, with them showing up? Right, y'all seen the Dave Chappelle sketch? Be like, my house is nice. It's, it's not extra nice, but it's too nice for me to have. I don't feel comfortable with police coming up. Be like, they feel like I stole my own house, stole my own car. But it also means that demographic change may shape police behaviors. And for me, this is both a methodological intervention and it's a, it's a theoretical invention that we need to be paying more attention to. 
So this is work that I've done with Ayo Lanianu, who's a, uh, used to be at CPE. He's now a junior uh, uh, faculty member at the University of Toronto. And in this city, contact, actually, excuse me, across cities, contact, not crime severity is the biggest predictor of force. You guys hear people saying, well, there's violent crime over there. Violence is not the thing. It's the number of times law enforcement has contact with you. Violent, if you're in a violent crime versus a, a commission of a nonviolent crime, you're only 1.25 times more likely, just a quarter to more likely to have force used on you. It's mostly about how many times you're in touch with police. So what we did was we took 1.6 million interactions from a large Mountain West city and thousands of use of force incidents. And then we co combined those with demographic data from the census and the American Community Survey. Okay, that's the data the federal government does keep on who lives where with what attributes. And then we did fancy math. And we're looking for use of force frequency in calls for service versus what officers do on their own. Calls for service being 911 calls. And our question really is, does the change in the white population of a given area increase the dangerousness of contact? Okay. So what we have to do, we got to aggregate those use of force incidents. Uh, incidents. We got to estimate the risk or burden of violence. So what we're going to do is we're going to compare the risk or burden from 911 versus on view. That's officer initiated, right? And so that, that means we're going to um, compare it top and bottom of fraction. Top is the number of use of force incidents. The bottom of the fraction is enforcement incidents. So if I gave out an arrest or I, if I arrested someone, I gave out a citation, that's an enforcement action. Okay, so that's the fraction we're looking at here. The majority of police citizen interactions are initiated by citizens calls for service. And here's what it looks like. So <clears throat> community initiated is 57% of the context in this city. Right. <clears throat> So we're looking at um, calls for service, whether or not they are productive and productive means that there was an enforcement action, means there was a reason to be there. Um, <clears throat> and here's what that looks like. So over on this side, we have officer initiated, over on this side, community initiated. Sanctions or arrests, that's they did something, no action, self-explanatory, they didn't do anything. And you see that for sanctions or arrests, for officer initiated, it's about 30% of the time. For community initiated, it's five point, it's negligible down here. Did nothing about a third of the time for officer initiated, almost half the time. So when call folks are calling 911, they're initiating contact that is mostly useless. Mostly nothing happens. Okay. Now, in terms of use of force, benchmarked against that productivity, officer in, uh, initiated that's on site, about 3% end up in use of force, about 4.5%, almost 50% more for 911 calls. Right. So when you're calling for you're calling 911, the chances that it ends up in use of force unrelated, right, to a commission of a crime is higher, significantly higher, almost 50%. But what about the change in white share of the block group? What about the change in the white population? How does that have an influence? So we looked at, at change in population over time. What we found was that for officer initiated contact, the use of force was basically flat. But for 911, the more white the neighborhood became, the more calls to 911 ended up in use of force. Now, if you are a skeptical person, good for you, that's good for science, or you're a good scientist, you're thinking, hey, as the share of the white population goes up, I'm not trying to be racist, doesn't the rent increase? Doesn't the average income of that neighborhood go up? Don't more people have college degrees? Maybe those could be driving these outcomes. And you're absolutely right to think that way. But it turns out that's just not the case. Because when you look at these models, it's not the change in rent. This is the triangle here means the delta, so the change. It's not the change in rent, not the change in income, not the change in BA. It's just the change in the white population. That's the only thing. This star here means it's significant. It's not significant in any of the other cases. Okay. So, of course, we got to change policing. Of course, we have to empower communities. Also, of course, Racism is systemic beyond policing. And so failing to deal with the broad systems that shape how we use policing means that we're gonna to fail to shape public safety the ways that we need to. So I'm, I should wrap up because I'm, I'm coming close to my hour. So I wanna summarize here that I think changing the definition of what we think of as racism and changing our theory of policing is an intervention in and of itself. And one of the things that everybody within the sound of my voice can take from this, 
and go forward. I'm also asserting based on this research that the question of if we've deployed police is more important to our problems than the question of how we deploy police. I've worked on the inside on this stuff and I did it because working on the outside wasn't feasible. It is now. We need not deploy police to places where police say, hey, we can't be useful. And communities say, hey, I just need the services. There's no need to do it. So that question, more important. That's what Ithaca is doing, what Berkeley is doing, um, what Red Wing is doing, um, what Minnesota is trying to do, what San Francisco just did. It's a bigger, more important lever. It doesn't mean the how isn't important. It just means the if is a bigger lever. But sometimes we got to do the how so we can get to the if. I'd also say that the mission of police and the mission of public safety is fundamental and it's under discussed. I gotta, before I, I wrap up, I also have to say we've only scratched the surface of these things. It's because we haven't had data. We've not been doing research and to the degree we've been doing research, we've been doing without a racial lens. That said, I am a data nerd. Under this shirt is a t-shirt that says justice nerd because that's literally our trademark hashtag, right? but there's no need to wait for data before we make change. Nobody waited for data before they criminalized black folks for generations. Nobody waited for data before there was 101 crack, uh, crack to powder cocaine disparity. We don't need to wait for data for the change, but we must have the data if we want to protect against the backsliding and the ultimate reversing of the pendulum that is coming. The backlash is coming. And as we move forward, we have to specify the levels at which racism is operating because they operate differently at the different levels. So we're going to end up with different outcomes, depending on what level we're talking about. And so as I'm getting out, I must say racism is bigger than character. And we miss the problem when we ignore situations. The racial disparities in policing are not just a problem with the police. And with that, I got to say, that means it's got to be all of us. We all have to be in this, in the ways that we think about making each other safer. It's not just who we call when we use law enforcement. It's how we think about punishment, violations of the social contract, and whether or not our goal is to punish people for the choices they make within the systems that provide them awful options that we chose for them. That's us, right? So with that, let me stop talking um, and let, let me have you guys ask questions. I appreciate you uh, standing, uh, sitting and listening, especially y'all who are on camera. I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to, to being engaged with y'all. Thank you so much, Dr. Goff. Thank you for being funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and so smart and showing people like what research can do. It was so great. So we're gonna start with some questions. Thank you, Dr. Goff. So I'll start with the first question. Sorry, you have to give me one moment. So I'm having a little bit of a Zoom glitch because I'm recording and so I can't go to the questions. Here we go. So these were questions that were submitted in advance when individuals uh, registered for the talk. And so the first question is, how do we fight to change the pervasive perception that Black people are criminals when statistically Black people are in the minority of offenders? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, and I get questions like this a lot. How do we change the perception? I want to both answer the question and challenge some of the assumptions that often comes with that question. I don't know about this particular questioner. Um, <clears throat> But I'll start with the challenging assumptions, which is that somehow we think about changing the perception as necessary to changing the consequences from it. And I'd say it often works the other way around, right? That in fact, if you change the material reality, you're gonna change the perception, right? So if we actually give black communities the resources they need, you know, you know what black folks actually do when they get money, right? Like there's all kinds of lovely sketches about giving the money away and the rest. But what they do is first they pay off debt, then they make sure they got food and they got housing. And then they start investing in the opportunity to advance higher, their own higher education, right? Advance their own. What humans do in a society where they, you imagine that you have a chance of advancing someplace. So the best thing we can do to mess with the representations of black folks as criminal is to give black folks the opportunities that are supposed to be guaranteed to everybody who participates in the society. Okay. That said, there are other places to intervene. 
right? And I would encourage you to think on multiple levels, right? So it's good to get stories out about black folks doing other sets of things. Like I said this all the time, there's those folks, black folks getting PhDs every year, don't see that on the news. Um, so making sure that the good stories are out there and there's a more robust element of it, right? By the way, CDC a number of years ago put out a report, I think it was 2012, put out a report um, uh, talking about the fathers who are in, invested in their families, who spend the most time with their kids, is black fathers, by the way, right? I, like, I know you would never be able to believe that by everything that gets represented, it's black fathers. Most spending most time with their kids out of any racial group. And that's the, the very, very liberal left-wing rag of the CDC, okay? <clears throat> so that's one piece of it. The other piece that I think is really important for those of us who are engaged in our local communities, go to your local um, news, news broadcasts. Travis Dixon has wonderful, wonderful research on the overrepresentation of black folks in local crime. And what he means is this, black folks commit crimes like that we in terms of the ways that we define them at higher rates than white folks. This is strongly predicted by um, concentrated disadvantage and poverty. But black folks, the level of crimes they commit, they're overrepresented on the local news in terms of black faces. So when white folks are committing crimes in a local capacity, you are less likely to see a white face on your television screen. How much worse is it on Twitter, on Facebook, on Nextdoor, on whatever the neo-fascist ring camera things that they do through Amazon? Uh, how much worse is it in social media when we're curating that? The stories we know to tell keep us telling the same stories. And so to the degree that you can be engaged in those spaces, you can do two things. One, tell the stories of full humanity. And the other is regulate the stories of violations so that they're at the very least representative of reality and not skewing that story so much. I have um, the next question. <clears throat> Can we rely on police departments to be able to distinguish those calls that need a social and in parentheses mental health, family therapist, social services response rather than a criminal crim, criminality response? And why must they always shoot to kill when the suspects are black? So that's a, a normative question that I can't fully answer, but I, I feel it. I feel it in my soul. And that, and that was asked with your chest. Um, so here's what I'll say. Um, there are communities that absolutely do not want to trust law enforcement to do a damn thing. And that mistrust is as earned as the trust that you'd hope they, that could, could happen later on. The mistrust is earned. So can we, I have worked with dedicated women and men in the public safety uh, field who I could trust to do that. But I think it's unfair that we should ask communities that don't trust law enforcement to trust them to investigate themselves, trust them to give up power, to trust them to, to ask for the assist. Not until there's a track record of them doing it right, doing it well, doing it at all. And there's no need for it. This wasn't part of the question, but I feel like it's a useful frame. So I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna take my little privilege on, on doing it. One of the things that I think is most convincing for folks who are, are struggling with this moment of defund or with the, the word abolition, is walking them through what happens after a tragic incident where there's been a sexual assault. I don't bring that up lightly. But if you know anyone who is a survivor of a criminal sexual assault where they have actually reported it, which takes its own kind of courage, right, and is its own special circumstances and no judgment on folks who don't, often what they have to do is they have to go down to a police station. They sit in a room and they're interrogated as if maybe they are lying as if maybe they are the ones who are therefore committing a crime by lying to law enforcement. Almost everyone I know who's gone through that experience says the worst thing is the assault and the second worst thing is telling somebody about it in a legal capacity. Why on earth do I need someone who is armed to take that report? Why couldn't it be someone with a social working background? Someone who understands, hey, here are some resources that you need. At some point, I'm gonna to need to ask you questions and those questions are gonna be difficult. Because the legal process requires that we make sure that someone is innocent until proven guilty. So I got to ask you questions that will feel rough. But until then, here are some resources you need. Let me walk you through what that process will look like. So we have a relationship. 
So you understand how these questions don't need to be violent, even in the context of a system that might be. Why on earth do we instead say, whoever the next person is who's rotated on to the sex crimes unit with a badge and a gun takes those questions? There's no reason to. And the craziest thing to me, the, sorry, the, the, the worst part, the most deranged part to me is that if we did it with the social workers, it'd be cheaper. So can we, should we? I have met folks in law enforcement we absolutely can trust. I have met some of the most dedicated, brilliant, committed folks. They run towards the danger and they put themselves between you and that danger. And they're absolutely caring. I, I work with them. My co-founder, my center, is retired law enforcement. We got about a third of the organization, retired law enforcement. But I, I think it's, it's lunacy to say that those communities that don't trust law enforcement right now should have to on, the, on this new path to public safety. It's cheaper, it's more efficient to set it up this, this better way. So we shouldn't fight against that. Dr. Goff, I have a question from the president of TCNJ. So uh, this is, and this is something I think all of us are, are thinking about. Uh, the question is whether there are findings from studies on campus policing that may affirm or contest the findings from non-campus policing. Yeah, it's a great question. We're, we're, yeah, I don't know if folks know, the Yale uh, Police Department is the oldest university police department um, in the country, um, something about which Yale is uh, both conflictedly proud and uh, ashamed. Um, it is complicated. In almost every jurisdiction where there is a significant university police department presence, communities would rather run into university police than city police or county police, county sheriffs, right? It's in part because university police understand if you get too rough with a student, somebody's parent might call. And majority wise, if we're talking about a residential college, because you don't have a commuter college, you don't need law enforcement, you get private security. You're talking about folks who have enough money to send their kids to college and live away from home. Right? Not that your parents don't love you, but they're very glad to see you go away. <laughs> so in those contexts, there is a kind of accountability to the folks being policed that there often isn't in vulnerable communities where a very small portion of the population is given very little and the majority of the population is happy for them to be treated savagely. So given all of that, how do we think about them in this moment where a smaller footprint is desired by many right thinking people? And there again, I think it's complicated because if you remove the university police in the same way that when you remove school police, who are you gonna call when there's an incident? Who are you gonna call the same police that everybody likes and trusts less, who have less training, right? And, and some of these contexts where the assaults are, are savage and awful between folks in the community, Right? You want the folks who are well-trained. I, I, I remember being in Baltimore, someone said, you know, I'm all for less policing, but when you know, somebody's coming breaking into my house, if you show up with a whistle and a, and, a, and a vest, I'm gonna kick you the heck out. And they didn't say heck. So it's complicated. But I think the way we make it more simple is this. If the goal is safety, and we understand that safety is first secured by giving vulnerable communities the resources they need to keep themselves safe, what is the university doing to protect the vulnerable communities around the university and within? What are we doing for food insecurity for our students? What are we doing for food insecurity for the local community? What are we doing for housing insecurity? What are we doing on um, sexual consent and awareness around these elements? What are we doing on substance abuse and misuse for a generation, for a cohort coming into the ability to abuse substances quasi-legally? We know what underage drinking is, right? It's the thing that's absolutely condoned and legal on college campuses. At least that's what it was every time that I've been visiting colleges, right? As a university president, you should, you should be shaking your head. No, I don't know which one that is, but but you guys all understand if any, in any city, where is the highest underage drinking and illicit um, narcotic use? I don't know which dorm room it is, but it's a dorm room. So we understand that folks are using substances to manage anxiety and manage pleasure. Are we giving them the resources to do that responsibly? To reduce the harms of that? And are we doing the same in the, in the broader communities? And when universities are more concerned with keeping students safe from community than keeping community safe for students, I think we're upside down in our morality. Thank you, Dr. Goff. 
So I have the next question, which is how can transparency help to improve policing effectiveness and their relationship with the community? It's a great question. And in the, the sort of early days of, of building up community trust, um, transparency was a huge deal. Um, it's important that we get those uh, the body cam footage out inside of 48 hours. It's important that we're transparent in a, a, a accountability process internally. I also want to uh, want to be clear. That's exactly what happened in Minneapolis. Chauvin was fired inside of 48 hours. Um, the other other officers as well. Body camera footage was put out same day inside of 24 hours. Right. The policies that that led through that investigation put out immediately. I also want to point out that George Floyd's still dead. Transparency is absolutely key for helping communities feel that their elected and appointed and employed representatives in public safety are worthy of their trust. But when we talk about justice for George Floyd, and I've said this a bunch of times, especially this week, ain't no justice for George Floyd. George Floyd is dead. Justice would be him still walking around, hugging his daughter, right? Aggravating his loved ones the way all of us get to do. We get to have accountability. That's a back end problem. And somehow we imagine that there's enough back end consequences. We'll end the front end. How about we just end the front end? So I'm all for transparency. I'm, really, it's a powerful thing. It's good for public trust. Public trust is good for public safety. But I care much more about the front end preventing the next George Floyd. And I know that y'all supposed to be in charge of the questions. And I'm, I'm, just, I'm only gonna do this this once. I did get a direct message from someone in the audience asking me about what was going on in Ithaca. And this is the right time it feels like for me to address that. So anonymous person who, who direct messaged me, nobody else do that because otherwise we y'all skip in the queue and I'm not for that. But I think it is useful to talk through what folks are trying to do. Nine months in June, we started vetting um, police departments. They didn't know why we were vetting them. We were vetting them to see where could we actually abolish a department and set up something from scratch. Nine months. And the first thing that happened when community groups got together, they said, we, we, love, we see you on TV, F you. And they didn't say F, they said the full word, F you. Because we've been through this process twice before in Ithaca. We put together a plan and nobody done nothing. So we had to have an accountability process for the processes they went through before. Do you know how many communities for which that's true? Almost every community that's got black people that have any kind of way to speak in the same language as the surrounding community. That was the first thing we had to do. And from there said, okay, so if y'all do any of these things, we are dropping out and we're going to raise holy hell. So there was accountability in the process up front for the electeds and, and for the elites. From there, they said, all right, so maybe we can trust this process. Maybe it'll go better. We got new actors in here. I want to make sure that our children are heard. And so they started an academy of high school students writing their senior high school honors theses on the process. And they were the dramaturgs of the whole thing. They, they kept track of what it was that we were doing. And they kept folks honest, because I don't know if any of y'all here are students, but it turns out your simple questions are often the most confounding to the so-called experts. Because the so-called experts are sitting there in the weeds talking about why it has been this way, not able to answer the question of why did it need to be. So getting students involved, getting young people involved was absolutely core. And in the end, what was said was, look, in Ithaca, it's a relatively homogenous group, right? Our, 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 our communities of, of concentrated disadvantage and vulnerability are relatively small. And we benefit when they're well. So why are we punishing them for the choices that they make within systems where we gave them terrible options? So we should give them resources in terms of stop gaps on mental health, substance abuse, food and housing insecurity. And we shouldn't punish them for that. Now that's not the same thing as somebody with a gun going around trying to kill people. And the folks in Ithaca and Tompkins County said, we want someone who can intervene there. Because as we know, we got a lot of guns in this country, and one person can take out a whole damn village. And it's not about a good guy with a gun. It's about the fact that there are folks who are trained to engage around violence. But public safety is mostly not about punishment. In the same way that we talked about accountability, and I'm saying that's at the back end, public safety is most, mostly about prevention. So they said we want majority unarmed. 
majority, like 100% public health led. We want civilian led. Pub I should say 100% public, public health centered, civilian led. So it's not led by professional law enforcement. It's led by someone who has a public health background and a public health future. All low level offenses, all nonviolent offenses, all non-criminal offenses, which by the way is 96% of 911 calls in most jurisdictions, 96%. All of that will go to people who are not armed, no law enforcement background. And what that means is there's a bunch of money being saved that will go to other programs, standing those things up within the, the department of community solutions, solutions community came up with and public safety. That's, that's what we wanted to do. It's what we've been wanting to do since the jump. And we found a place that had the ability to do it. And I, I, I say, I fully expected that the union was going to sue to try and stop it. And when the union came out in favor, I, I, I cried. I cried ugly tears. Um, uh, don't imagine it. It was embarrassing. It was big snot bubbles. Um, and I did it again um, when the final vote was cast and it became locked in as the absolute plan that they will be following. And the next day we got up, popped a little bubbly for the morning and we started writing job descriptions. Because the work of implementation is going to be absolutely backbreaking. And the nation's attention will be on the folks in Ithaca and Tompkins County. So when things go wrong, which they will, people will weaponize it. You may have seen a piece in the New York Post talking about one of the, the council members, the committee members, and his past. There was a piece in the New York Post saying that all of this was funded by George Soros, and therefore it's all corrupt which is a convenient form of anti-Semitism, even though there was no money from the Open Society Foundation or George Soros that went into it. It doesn't matter. There's, you, it, there's always room for anti-Semitism, right? Like you can always find space. It's like, it's like Jello. There's always room for it. You can fit it into some stories. And the point in all of this is they're just regular folks. And they saw what you guys saw over the summer. And they said, we don't have to do that here. And the plan they put together, I think, is the most comprehensive, most visionary plan I have seen. And we'll see how it rolls out. We'll see what we need to do the next time. But I encourage you, go ahead and search for it. And you can read the, the GQ article that's got the, the Maris Fonte Myrick in all glossy, or you can read the stuff from the Ithaca newspaper. I encourage you to read the stuff in the Ithaca newspaper. But the plan is available and online. Go through it. See how it works. See how it doesn't. Understand that it is the next best step. And we'll see what the step after that is. Okay, I have another question. What are your thoughts on the current case against Derek Chauvin and the $27 million payment to the family? Could this be thought of as reparations? Thank you for that question. Um, I get asked about the case multiple times a day. Um, I will say that what you have seen so far um, is everybody and their mama now from the Minneapolis Police Department come out and say, mm -mm, not like us. Mm -mm because no one in law enforcement wants to be painted with this brush. And, and I think that that should be transparent for us. And I think we should be the ones to decide whether or not we believe that testimony writ large. That's the first thing I think. Because right now we're talking about holding one officer accountable for a lynching that we all witnessed. And everybody who's a professional in law enforcement said it was wrong. I mean, we had an MMA fighter who happened to be walking by said it was wrong. We had someone call the cops on the cops. We had a, a nine-year-old girl. And I want to be really clear. Everybody who witnessed that, from us to the folks who were on the street, there will be no remedy for the injuries to us. That's what I think about that. That one trial is too small to fix what was broken, and it is not the kind of accountability that we need. Because what happened on that street was not just what Derek Chauvin did to George Floyd. It was the accumulation of what we have permitted to happen so long as we didn't have to watch in black communities all over the country. Should we think about it as reparations? No, we should not. That money, that was a blood payment. Someone murdered someone. And that was the beginnings of an apology from a city who was accountable, who should have been accountable. That goes nowhere near paying off the 400 plus years of unpaid debts 
owed for black labor, black life, black death in this country. Nowhere near. That number is in the tens, if not the hundreds of trillions of dollars. We, we're, not, we're not getting that in our stimulus checks. The whole country is not getting it. The best economists of our age are not clear that the United States has the wealth to pay back just black folks. That doesn't count what we've been doing to Asian folks, though we got a little bit of reparations for the internment camps for the Japanese folks. It doesn't count what we've done to native folks because y'all understand I'm sitting here on Quinnipiac land, right? They call it Connecticut, but I know where I'm at. It doesn't count what we've been doing to lots of folks because that whole Southwest of this thing that we call this country, that's Mexico. When we think about reparations, I want us to make sure that we have uh, the, the full scope and that we're not trying to take down an elephant with a toothpick. $27 million, I know that sounds like a lot. It's more than I'm gonna earn in my lifetime, I know that. For $27 million, that's not really rich people money. That's not really nation money, much less the most powerful and richest nation in the history of humanity, almost entirely built on the back of black labor that was entirely uncompensated. So I get the, the impulse, but that is nowhere near reparations. Not the right frame, not any of it. It is blood money, it is a blood payment, it is an apology that is thin in comparison to the, the fullness of what was stolen. Thank you. So picking up on uh, what you were telling us about Ithaca, what role, if any, did Cornell University, Ithaca College, and Tompkins Cortland Community College play in supporting the move to the Community Solutions and Public Safety Department? That's a great question, um, and it's actually a better question for my uh, colleague, Tracy Cassie. Um, who was uh, leading the, uh, the coordination efforts. I do know that we had students who got, who got involved, um, which was fantastic. So they're, they're, we don't do anything in this country that's worthy of history books without students being involved. Um, so if the secret question underneath that is what could college in New Jersey students be involved in, I, everything I'm talking about, right? Like we got interns um, that come through, um, uh, the, the, the state of New Jersey is, has just launched a public use of force platform it's kind of a mess, but it's also kind of great. Get involved in that. Learn about the data. If you're scared of math, don't let that stop you. Figure out how to do it because math is just storytelling with numbers. Um, but in Ithaca in particular, I know it was the high school students that were uh, involved earliest on. Um, and then there was, uh, I think, more limited involvement at the college level. Um, but there's no shortage of what college students can be doing here at Yale. There's multiple, in fact, competing um, student organizations for Yale Police Disarmament, for Abolition, um, for Abolition Now. I think there's a Yale Police Disarmament for Abolition and Abolition Now organizations, like the three folks who are in all three groups. They decided to make a super group. I don't know, one of them plays guitar. You get the general idea. Like there's plenty of stuff to be done. But in Ithaca specifically, I think there was somewhat more limited student involvement in part because Bluntly, um, there is a significant town-gown divide in Ithaca. The folks who live there and the folks who work there, th those are not the same. Um, uh, so I know that there was some involvement, but I think it was more limited than it was from the high school students. I guess it's my turn, let's see. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Mm. What steps should I take if I'm racially profiled as a black woman, a black teenager? It's a great question. It's a hard question to answer. Um, it, I, I'm gonna start with what um, all social scientists usually start with. The answer to a difficult question, it depends, sorry. Um, so if you're being profiled in a car, that's different than if you're being profiled on foot. Um, what I tell everybody is the most important thing for you to do in that interaction is to go home safe. In that same context, sometimes you can't feel like you can go home safe if you've given up your enti the entirety of your power, right? Just because someone is profiling you does not mean that they get to define you. You do absolutely have your rights and you can stand firm in them. You got to feel out how to get home safe and what safety is going to mean for you. 
So within that context, right, you've heard people talk about compliance. Um, where I would say is the place where I start to get nervous on somebody's behalf is when somebody is trying to put handcuffs on or get me into the back of a, of a, of a black and white, back of a, of a police car, um, uh, before I've had the opportunity to, to, to have explained to me what's happening, right? So it should not be the case that I am detained if they have searched me and I don't have a weapon on um, without having that explanation. There's no reason for it. And in most New Jersey um, uh, municipal uh, law enforcement codes, they should be explaining you are under arrest for, or I need to detain you for. Those are the places where I push back hardest. Otherwise, sit, answer questions, and you can always ask, am I free to go at the very beginning? If they say, yes, you're free to go and you start to walk away, right? I know that can be scary, but if they say yes, and then they do something to you, they know they will actually lose their jobs. So ask the question if you are feeling comfortable enough to ask the question. And if you're not, there is no shame in just being compliant so that you can physically go home at the end of the day and live to tell that story. Because the stakes of this are life and death. Thanks, I think we have time for one last question. And so that is, what can I, an average individual, do to affect change? So is actually the question I get most on college campuses. Um, first, I have to push back on the premise. Ain't nobody in here average, no such thing. Okay? <laughs> so just no, no, and no to that premise. Um, my dad is a philosopher, which is to say my dad is very annoying. Um, and in addition to making it very difficult to get the salt as a child, may I have the salt? Oh, so now I'm in charge. Can I have the salt? Oh, well, so you're asking about whether or not you are possibly able to be in possession. I was like, dad, I'm gonna give, give it a salt. That salt, I want it, please. The thing there, the white crystals, put it in my hand so I can put it on my food. Um, so in addition to being annoying, um, what it means is that he reads a lot. And he likes to tell long stories. That's part of, part of where I get it from. Um, and what he used to say is he talked about... Uh, Ironically, a philosopher who's also known as a psychologist. Why am I telling you this story? William James, that philosopher also understood as a psychologist, used to say, if you want to be a philosopher, go where philosophers go. It's kind of an important distinction between that and the, what I would consider to be the standard advice to folks. It's not just do the investigation. It's not just follow your passion. It's not what do you want to do. It's be in the life of the people who are doing the work that you value. Be close to it, see what it's like, try it on, right? So I mean, folks who are in college right now, you're being told, oh, follow your dreams, fall in love with your dreams. Don't fall in love with your dreams. Look at what happened when you fall in love to you, with, with your next door neighbor, right? Like date them for a little while before you fall in love with them. Try it on, inhabit the life close to the people who are doing the work that you see as valuable. Because there's something in your chest, something in your soul that you are making, that's making that seem valuable. You might learn that what it is, is none of that. You might learn that fundamentally that work is corrupt and you'll now know that you don't want to be pursuing it. Something feels wrong about it, that there's lots of gross people in it. By the way, almost anything you're doing, there's lots of gross people in it. I'm sorry to ruin, your, ruin that, right? <clears throat> but trying on the life that's closest to what you think of as being good in the world, it's just, there is no substitute for it. Because most of the world is not a straight path unless you choose that for yourself. It's not you show up and you get onboarded and you understand all the things that are expected of you. Most of the world is you're being evaluated in terms that have never been made clear to you. And success will be, uh, be a combination of how it's socially defined by people who won't articulate that to you and how you define it yourself. So learn by doing. And anybody here can go on to figure out, you know what, I did that and I did that and I was in it and these things don't make sense separately, but I'm the one who could put it together. And it may seem dumb for you. You're just doing two different things, that you, but that might be the thing. That might be the thing. All I am doing here is basic social science and basic organizing and activism. But when you put those two things together, you have the first time that this country has bothered to measure what the armed representatives of the state do to the descendants of formerly enslaved people. It's not a small thing. And all I did was knit it together. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. I appreciate it. We appreciate it so much.
Can we all take, can we all say thank you? Take out, and he, he wants this interaction. So everyone take off your mic and say thank you to Dr. Gall. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all y'all. I see friends in the room. I see Jen Little Hills. I see friends in the room. Thank you all for coming <laughs> um, and spending time. Thanks for building. Um, y'all go out and be safe and, and take care of each other. Dr. Goff, will you come back again? <laughs> like next week? <laughs> no, 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 no. In person, in person when we yes, take you out to dinner person. and have- saying, Like next week is nothing, come on now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so any any chance of me getting closer to Philly, um, you know, that's that's always an easy thing to do. So all, all y'all gotta do is holler. Can I come visit you? My family's from Connecticut. Maybe I can pop into your office and say hi when we're all COVID free. <laughs> but I say you can't pop into my office before I've been in my office. Oh, I know, right? <laughs> I've literally never been in my office before. I have stuff in there. My best books are in there, but I haven't been in. Oh, because you just moved during this whole time, right? Yeah. So I mean, we were in Manhattan, um, and then we moved up here. So we're in the house. Um, it's about a half hour walk that way. I have literally not stepped inside of it yet. <sighs> Don't even know if my name's on the door. I, I know I got <laughs> I got furniture and books. That's what I know. So, all right, thank you I'm for real. Thank you all very much. I think I'm, I'm good, right? Yeah, you're Dr. good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Goff. This was amazing. Thank you. For real, it's my pleasure. Y'all for real. Thank you. Stay blessed. Be good. Well, you too. Take, Take care. care.